Hey guys, thanks for joining me for episode Learn to Play Games. My name is Lance, and today we're going to take a look at Giant Killer Robots Heavy Hitters. This is a game by Wooda Workshops and CryptoSoa Games. It is a one to four player game that takes roughly an hour to two hours to play, and it is a competitive game. So each player is going to be working against the other players to just be the first to destroy all the other players' heavy hitters, or to be the first to destroy four buildings. And if whichever player does that will be the overall winner of the game. So in the game itself, each player is going to be playing a pilot that is going to be controlling their heavy hitter, which is a big, huge mech warrior. And throughout the game, players are going to be trying to destroy buildings by tagging them and destroying them and gaining sponsorship through companies that are trying to publicize and turn this into a money-making affair. Or they're just basically out there to try to blow up the other player's mechs. They're going to do this by performing different types of attacks, moving around the city and positioning themselves in the best spots in order to destroy the other players. So my opinions on this one, I had a really good time with it. I would definitely recommend this one to players that like mechs or different type of city combat. This one is really interesting and it offers a couple of really cool features. Uh, mainly the strategy between trying to destroy your opponents and tagging buildings as it is completely possible to destroy four buildings and win the game that way versus just trying to blow up other players. Uh, by getting out your support units and moving around the city very tactically, you can tag and destroy buildings fairly quickly and really put uh, the other players on their heels. So depending upon which approach you want to do, or you can go straight combat and really get into positions to take advantage of that and blow up the other players. So each way is very interesting and offers a lot of different variety within it. Uh, the other really cool feature is that each player's deck cards that they're using to control their heavy hitters is also their health. So as the players take damage, they're slowly losing cards from that deck, which could be very powerful attack cards or counter cards or all kinds of different things. So as players take damage, they're all they're also becoming less effective and their, their mechs are slowly breaking down, which is a really interesting feature as well. So like I said, I would definitely recommend checking this one out if you're into those type of games, or if you if you enjoy competitive games, this one definitely is a great game for that as well. So of course, these are just my opinions. I'd love to hear yours in the comment section below. Let me know if you've played this game, or if you're interested in this one, or backed it on Kickstarter, as this one was a Kickstarter a little while back. Let me know in those comments below what you guys thought of that as well. And as always, if you guys enjoy these videos, if you like what I do, please consider that like button and subscribing to my channel, as it really does help me to grow. It's one of the most important things that companies look at when they decide whether or not they want to go with me. So if you guys want to continue to see these videos or to see some of those hot new topics, titles out there, please consider subscribing and hitting that like button as it will really make a big difference for me. So if you want to stay up to date on all my videos as well, consider hitting that notification bell so you get notifications anytime I release new content. So let's head to the table and I'll teach you guys how to play. The first thing I want to go over are the heavy hitter cards. At the beginning of the game during setup, each player is going to create a deck of 25 cards that are going to control their heavy hitters throughout the game. This deck is also going to count as the heavy hitter's life and is comprised of four different types of cards. We have weapon cards, reaction, deploy, and maneuver cards. I'd like to take you guys through a breakdown of each of these cards now. So with the weapon cards in the top corner is going to be a number. That is the speed of that weapon. So during the combat round, the higher the number, the sooner that weapon will activate during that round, as you guys are gonna see later. Underneath that is the type of weapon that we have, which there are three different types. We have primary weapons, secondary weapons, and orbital weapons. Then in the orange, we have the class of the weapon, which there are three different classes, ballistic, missile, and energy. And I'll go into a little bit more detail about those later. Then we have the card's name and the artwork for that card. And then we have the three different stats for the weapon cards. The first is energy or the cost to use that card in energy. Then we have the range of the weapon and finally the amount of damage that weapon does. Then in bold white letters, we have when that card can be used. So for example, with this card, you can play it during the combat phase. And then finally, each card is going to have a description telling you more effects or conditions for that card. Moving down, we have reaction cards. And these are usually defensive cards. And again, you're gonna list the name at the top, any when that card can be used and any other conditions of that card. Then we have the deploy cards, which are the way, one of the ways you can bring out support units. Each of these cards is going to cost you two energy to use and the range of deployment for that support unit. Again, when it'll be able to be played and any conditions for that card as well. Finally, we have maneuver cards. These are usually cards that are going to allow you to move your heavy hitter 
at some point. And again, they're going to tell you when you can use them and what conditions are there for them. Finally, each heavy hitter is going to be controlled by a pilot, which is going to be selected during setup. And each pilot is going to have some sort of bonus or condition that will grant players additional things throughout the game. Throughout the game, each player is going to have access to three different types of support units as well. We have combat units, repair units, and recon units. So let me take you guys through a breakdown of their cards real quick as they're a little bit different. So again, at the top corner is going to be a number, and that is the weapon speed for the particular type of units. And again, the higher the number, the sooner that unit will activate during the combat round. Underneath that is the type of unit it is. So again, we have the combat, repair, and recon units. And then again, each player or each unit also has a class of weapon. So again, missile, energy, and ballistic. Then each unit has a name. And going down one side is the amount of hit points that the support units have. Once they have, have taken that number of hit points, then that unit is eliminated and returned back to the player's reserve, which then it can be brought out again later on. Then we have the support units have four different types of stats. They have defense, move, the range of their weapons, and the amount of damage they do. And then again, additional information for that unit. And then at the bottom is the line of sight that that unit has, or how many spaces away it can actually see and spot. As you guys will see later on, this is important. Then the last type of cards that our players will have access to throughout the game are going to be sponsor cards. And these are going to have all kinds of different effects and bonuses for the players throughout the game as they collect these cards. They'll be able to give them little perks that they'll be able to use. And again, the card will tell you when you can use it. The first time you pop the box, you're also going to have to assemble the buildings. Now, if you have the base set, then the buildings are going to be cardboard. And if you have the expansion set, the buildings are going to come in plastic. So with those, you're just simply going to have to glue them together by gluing the two parts of the building and then they top on. Do not glue the, bo the bottom of the building to the base, as you're going to need that to be able to come off. If you have the cardboard buildings, the easiest way to assemble them is to turn them over and to carefully bend each one of the joints up so that it is completely flexible. Once you have that done, then you can go ahead and bring the building together, place the top on, and connect it to its base. From there, then you're ready to place that building. The last thing we need to go over is the achievements track. So at the beginning of the game, when a player selects a pilot, they're going to place their pilot's token on the start space of that track. Throughout the game, as players accomplish the different goals, they get to move their pilot forward one space on that track each time they meet one of these goals, and each goal can be met multiple times. So there are four different goals. The first is when you become the Glory Hound during the reset phase. The second is when you make a successful alley shot or flank shot. The third is when you demolish a building. And the final one is if you have three support units in play at the end of the combat phase. Each time you meet one of these conditions, you're going to get to move your pilot forward one space on that track. And each time you reach a space that has the smiley hex on it, you're going to unlock the achievement that is associated with that based on the number of smiley faces. So with our pilot here, he would unlock this first one, and then we would flip it over to its activated side. When he reaches the second space, we will unlock the second one. And finally, on the third one, we would unlock the final achievement. And each of these achievements will get us better to hit rolls for our different units, as you guys are going to see throughout the game. For player setup, each player is going to receive a dashboard that is going to have a spot for their faction deck and discard pile, as well as their damage. Then each player has an energy track on the side, which at the beginning of the game you go and set your energy marker to 5. Each player is also going to receive 3 achievement tokens, one of each type, and these will be on the locked side. You can also give each player their different tag tokens. And their faction deck that we've just created can be shuffled up and placed face down on the draw pile. Each player also has their three different types of second, uh, support units, the recon, repair, and combat unit. With the combat and repair unit, you can also put a marker on their hit points on the top spot. So the combat unit has three hit points and the repair unit has two. There is no need to put one on the recon unit as it only has one hit point. Then you can also receive the miniatures for these as well. Finally, each player gets their heavy hitter mech. And there's also a quick reference card to tell you the different combat and defense values. For board setup, the first thing you're going to do is place out the board and choose which side you're going to play on as the 
board itself is double sided as you guys can see here. From there then you can choose either a map to play on or create your own. If you want to use a pre-generated map you'll find those on pages 35 to 38. And for the game that I'm just going to be setting up I'm going to be using the plateau map which is a two player map which will be found on page 38. From there then we're going to go ahead and place out all the buildings on our map according to the map that we're selected. And the grid itself is going to be labeled from 1 to 8 and then from A to K to help you guys out. Now when placing buildings on the grid the most important thing to remember is the orientation of the building itself. So you want to have each one of these little sections here lining up with one of the hexes that the building is adjacent to. If you place the building wrong, you'll have it like this, and it will not line up properly, and that won't work for the game. So you want to make sure that all your building tops are lined up with each of the hexes around them. From here, we're going to determine who the starting player is going to be. So each player will roll a set of dice. So our player over here has a 9, and our player over here has an 11. So our player over here will be the first player, and will receive the Glory Hound token. From there, starting with the Glory Hound player and moving counterclockwise around the table, each player is going to choose a faction to play. So our Glory Hound player will be the first one to go, and he's going to choose to play the Diamondback Industries faction. So he'll receive all of the faction stuff for that. And then our other player will go ahead and choose to play the Hammer Strike AMG faction. Once both players have their faction set up, then starting with the player that is the Glory Hound, each player is going to choose and place their heavy mech in one of the starting locations. So our player with the Diamondback Industries will go first. He'll place his heavy down here. And then our other player will go, and he's going to place his up here. And those are outlines on the map, as you guys can see here as well. Then, starting with the player to the right of the Glory Hound and proceeding counterclockwise around the table, each player is going to choose a pilot to play, with the Glory Hound player choosing last. So our player over here with Hammer Strike is going to go first, and he's going to go ahead and select Isaac Jones. So he will place his pilot down here, and now no other player can choose that pilot for the rest of the game. And each pilot is going to give that player a special ability that they can use throughout the game. So moving over to our other player, the Diamondback, he's going to take Nyx. So we'll place her over here. Then we're also going to be placing out the achievements board. And our, each player is going to place their pilot token on that achievement board. One of the players can also grab the sponsors deck and shuffle that up as well and place that off to the side. It's time to create our faction deck now. So each player is going to create a custom 25 card deck that is going to control their heavy hitter throughout the game. And it's also going to count as their hit points. So each heavy hitter is going to come into the game with one primary weapon. And we'll have four different primary weapons to choose from, and each of these primary weapons comes with five cards of the same type. So based on the type of style that you want to play, go ahead and select one of those primary weapons now. So I'm going to go ahead and take this one here. And you're going to take the full set of five cards and place it off to the side. The rest of the primary weapons will not be used for this game. Then we can choose two secondary weapons to include in our deck, and each of these is going to have four cards with it. So again, you're going to choose the secondary weapons based on the play style that you're looking to achieve. So let's go ahead and take this one here, and we'll take this one here. Again, the rest of these can be set off to the side. Then we can choose, if we want to, to include any orbital strike cards. So let's go ahead and take one of those, and we can choose any number of deploy cards. So for our game, let's go ahead and take four of those out of the five that are possible. So at this point, that makes uh, puts us up to uh, eight cards for our secondary, five additional for our primary to put us at the 13, one orbital for 14, and four deploy cards for a total of 18. So we have seven cards left which we can choose the remaining sets. And each of these usually has two cards in it. So let's go ahead and take one of each of the different types of reaction cards for a total of five. And we'll take the two different types of movement cards. So that will be our deck of 25 cards. The rest of these cards can be just be returned to the box. Now that we know how to set up our faction deck, each player is going to draw the top six cards from their faction deck. Now, a player, if a player does not like their initial hands, they can choose to shuffle those six cards back into their faction deck and draw six new cards. This is going to be called a reboot. That player may only do this once per game and only during the initial setup. 
GKR Heavy Hitters is played over an undefined number of rounds. Each round is going to be broken into five phases, which are deploy, move, combat, tagging, and reset. During the rounds, players are going to be trying to tag buildings and destroy each other's heavy mechs. The first phase in each round is the deploy phase. Starting with the player that has a Glory Hound token and proceeding in a clockwise manner, each player will have an opportunity to deploy one support unit if they wish. So we're going to start with our player over here, and we're going to go through their cards, and then if they have a deploy card, we can choose to use that to deploy a support unit. They can still deploy a support unit if they do not have a deploy card, but it's going to cost them four energy instead of the deploy card's two energy. And then with our player, their pilot has a special ability that requires one less energy when deploying. So normally it's going to cost us two, but with her ability, it'll only cost us one energy. From there, then she's going to choose one of her three support units to deploy this round. So she's going to choose the Death Rattler combat unit. And when you deploy, you're going to deploy in an unoccupied hex up to two hexes away from your heavy hitter unit. So we'll place our combat unit up there. And then we will move on to the next player. So moving over to our Hammer Strike faction player, we again will look through their cards. They do have a deploy card and they also wish to deploy a unit. So they'll do that and it's going to cost them two energy. So they're down to three, and then they'll choose one of their support units to deploy. So he's going to deploy his recon unit, and he'll place it up here. The second phase in the round is the movement phase, and during this phase, it will start with the Glory Hound player and proceed clockwise around the table, with each player having an opportunity to activate each one of their units in a specific order, which is done starting with the heavy hitters first, and then the following support units, which will be the combat unit first, followed by Repair, and finally the Recon Units. I'm going to cover that in detail in just a minute, but first off, let's go ahead and take a look at the special rules for movement for the Heavy Hitters and the Support Units. So with Heavy Hitters, they have a number of requirements. First off, for every space that a Heavy Hitter moves, it's going to cost one energy from your reactor. And when a Heavy Hitter moves, they can move through spaces that their own units are in, but they cannot end in those spaces. They can also not move through or end in a building space. And with enemy units, they can never move into a space that has an enemy heavy hitter. But if there's an enemy unit, so let's say that this support unit was here, our heavy hitter can end in this space. It cannot move through there, but it can end in a space with, another, with an enemy's support unit. If it does, then that support unit must move into one of the adjacent available spaces of the opponent's choice. Now, once a heavy hitter moves, whether they choose to move any spaces or not, they can always choose their facing. So a heavy hitter has three rear facing sides and three front facing sides. So it can choose whenever it stops its movement where it wants to position itself. Support units also have their own set of rules governing their movement. With support units, they can move through any friendly faction model, but they can never end on the same space as a, as a friendly model. They can never move through buildings or end on building spaces, and they can never move through or end on any opposing units' spaces. The one exception to this are the recon units. So with the recon units, they are able to move over buildings or over enemy units, but again, they can never end on a building or enemy unit space. And with support units, they do not cost energy to move. Each one of them has their movement value listed on their card, so you'll simply follow that. And they also have a 360 degree facing, so it does not matter on their orientation when you finish their movement. Moving back to the beginning of the phase now, let's take a look at an example of this. So starting with our player that has a Glory Hound token, which is going to be our Diamondback player, we're going to go ahead and start with their turn first. So that player gets to move their Heavy Hitter first during the round, and so they're, each space that they move, they're going to have to spend an energy. So with our heavy hitter, our player is going to spend two energy to move him over here. And then again, he's going to position the base in the facing that he wants. So with him moving two spaces, he'll spend two. And then from there, it's going to move to the next pay, player in clockwise order, which will be our green player, which is the hammer strike faction. So with him, he is going to go ahead and spend two energy as well, but also his pilot is going to let him spend one fewer. So he gets to move basically one space for free, and then he's gonna move two spaces to this space here, and he'll rotate that way. So he'll spend two energy for that. 
and then it'll go back to our player that has the Glory Hound token to start with his support units. The first support unit to be moved in each round is going to be the combat unit. So our player over here has a combat unit. And with his combat unit, it's going to allow him to move one space. Now, with the combat unit, each player's combat unit is allowed to, you can spend one energy in order to move one additional space. So with our combat unit, we'll move up one space here. And then from there, if our player does not want to spend energy, which he doesn't, then it'll move back to our hammer strike player to move his combat unit. He does not have one out, so he will not move. And then it'll go back to our diamondback player to move their repair unit, which again, they do not have out. So it'll go back to our green player to move theirs. They do not have one. Finally, it'll go back to our yellow player to move his recon unit, which he does not have. So it'll go back to our hammer strike player to move his, which his unit can move up to four spaces. So he's going to go ahead and move him over here. Like that. And that'll end the movement phase. Now, either player can also play any movements or maneuver cards that they have in their hands. And those cards will let that player know when they can play them and what effects they have. Now, if we take a quick look at one of the examples of a maneuver card, our Diamondback player here has a maneuver card called Quick Rotation, as you guys can see. And this particular one is going to affect his heavy hitter. And it says that he can play it at any time, which will allow him to rotate his heavy hitter to any facing and then discard a faction card from his hand and draw a new one. One other important note that I want to point out, with this phase or any phase where the players are going to be spending energy, a player can always choose to spend more energy than they have remaining moving into the negative energy bracket. In this way, the players are basically overexerting their reactors, which is going to cause the player damage as well. They will get to perform whatever action they choose to, but it's also going to hurt them. For each point of energy that the player moves into the negative mark, they're going to have to discard one card from their hands or draw pile of their choice into their damage section, representing that they are taking damage to their heavy hitter because they're overexerting their reactors. The first step in this phase is going to be declaring attacks. So each player is going to select from their hands any heavy hitter cards they wish to declare, and they're going to place them face down in front of them in a firing line. Both players can also choose to add any support unit cards in play to that firing line. Now one important note to this is that a player may only play one of each unique weapon card per combat round. Therefore they may only play one primary, one of each of their secondaries, and an orbital card. And for this example I'm going to move a couple of these units around real quick so that we can have a better example of this. So I'm going to go ahead and move our player's unit up here like that and... Let's go ahead and move our recon unit over here. So our Diamondback player, let's take a look at theirs first. So we have the Viper missiles, we'll go ahead and play that face down. And then we'll add our combat unit as well to that order. And I think that'll be it for him. Moving over to the Hammer Strike player, they're also going to use their recon unit. And we'll go ahead and use this one. The second step is revealing declared cards. So both players are going to simultaneously flip over all of their declared cards or their firing line. From there then the players are going to deduct the total energy cost for the declared weapons immediately. So our player over here is that his card is going to cost him one energy. And our hammer strike player's card is going to cost him two. So that's going to put him into the negatives. So he's going to have to choose one card to place in his damage systems. So he'll choose that one. Now there's also one important note with this. At the end of the combat phase, any declared weapon cards that have not been used must be returned to the player's hand. In these instances, the weapon's energy cost is not going to be regained. This will often be the result of an opponent's sponsor card or choosing a weapon that has no valid target. The third step will have our players rearranging their firing lines so that they have their highest numbered weapon card first and then moving through that line to their lowest numbered weapon. So our green player over here is already set and ready to go with his as well. 
From this point moving forward, the players are going to resolve their attack cards with the highest numbered card going first between all of the players and then moving down through the numbers. So in this way, the players will not be moving in a clockwise manner. It will go to the player that has the highest number of cards. So the same player might be able to activate two or three other weapon cards if they're all higher than all the other players' cards. So then we're going to move into the fourth step, which is selecting a valid target. And this is going to be a semi-complicated step, so I'm going to do my best to break it down and give you guys plenty of examples. So first off, a card you're going to check for firing arc with the heavy hitters. And again, the heavy hitters have a front facing, which are the front three sides and a rear facing. So they can only fire out of the three front sides of their firing arc. Now with the support units, they have 360 degrees, so they, it does not matter with them. Next, you're gonna check line of sight. You're gonna do this by counting the number of spaces between you and your target by the shortest path or paths. If one or more of those paths pass through a building, your target has partial cover. If all of those shortest paths pass through a building, then your target has full cover and you're not allowed to target them with direct fire weapons, which are going to be ballistics and energy weapons. So let's look at an example of this with our heavy hitter here. Let's say that he's trying to target this guy here. So we're going to count the shortest route, one, two, three, four to the target. One, two, three, four, five. So our only target, our only valid path is straight through this building. So that means that our heavy hitter cannot see the heavy hitter back here. And likewise, the heavy hitter cannot see our heavy hitter in front of him. Now, if we look at another example here, let's go ahead and say with our support unit here, we're going to check and see if we have line of sight to this heavy hitter. So we're going to count our paths. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So our shortest paths are four spaces, and one of them is going to pass through a building, which means that our heavy hitter has partial cover to our support unit there. And the same thing with this support unit to that one. Our shortest path is one, two, three. One, two, three. So again, one of the paths passes through a building. So both of these targets would have soft cover or partial cover against each other. Now, if, for example, we had a situation where our, our support unit was out here, if he was targeting the recon unit, his shortest path to him is one, two spaces, and that is the shortest path, and there's no buildings in between them, so he would, this one would have no cover in that situation. And I'll cover the effects of cover during the attack section. The one other important thing I want to cover real quick before moving on is spotting. So this is going to be where support units are really going to shine, and this is going to be used for indirect fire weapons such as missile weapons. So when a target is not within line of sight of a heavy hitter, they can only be attacked by using indirect weapons, which are missiles, with assistance from a support unit spotting the target. In this instance, the target is considered to have no cover, gaining no bonuses to their target number, and I'm going to cover that a little bit more later. A successful spot is going to require that the target be within one or more supporting unit's line of sight, and each supporting unit's line of sight range is indicated at the bottom of their card, as you guys can see here. So if we look at an example of this, with our heavy hitter here, he does not have line of sight to our other heavy hitter because of the shortest path going through the building. So normally he could not target that unit unless he's using an indirect fire weapon, such as a missile weapon, and one of his support units can successfully spot that unit for him. So with our combat unit here, its line of sight, as you guys can see, has range of four hexes. So he is within range, one, two, three, four, so he can spot this heavy hitter for our heavy hitter if our heavy hitter is using a missile weapon, which they are the Viper missiles. So in that situation, he will be able to target that heavy hitter. Now, if, for example, our guy was over here and nobody could spot, then again, he could not use that. So moving back to our example now, let's go and take a look at some of this in action. So our players are going to consult their highest card, which our Hammer Strike player has the highest card with his recon unit at 950, as you guys can see here. So he's going to be the first one to activate. From there, then we're going to follow that sequence. So first off, we're going to select a valid target. So he's going to choose this support unit here with his recon unit targeting it. As his recon unit's weapon, weapons range is one to three spaces, so he's going to Count that out, one, two, three, and one, two, three. So our support unit here is going to have partial cover as one of those shortest paths pass through a building. Now that we know that our recon unit has range and line of sight to this unit, we're ready to perform the attack. 
So our Hammer Strike player is going to go ahead and grab the attack dice, which are the two black dice, and give them a roll. From there, then we're going to determine if that was a successful hit or not by checking the opposing unit's target number. In order to determine the target number of the unit you're attacking, you're going to look at your quick reference guide and determine the number. So first off, if you're targeting a support unit, you're going to need a 7 or better to score a hit. And then if you look at the bottom of the card, there's also combat modifiers. So if you're attacking a unit's flank, it's going to subtract 1 from that number. If, you are, if that target has partial cover, it's going to add plus 1 to that number. And if you're making an alley shot, which I'll cover that in a little bit, you're going to add plus 2 to that number. So with our recon unit, it's going to be targeting our support unit here. And with it being in partial cover, it's going to receive plus 1 to its targeting number. So our recon unit would need to roll an 8 or better to score a hit. So in this situation, our recon unit failed as it only rolled a 5. But let's go ahead and say, for example, that it happened to roll the 8 that it needed. The attack was successful, and it's going to do 2 damage to that support unit. And that support unit will get to roll its defense. With the attack being successful, the defending player now has the opportunity to roll armor saves to try to prevent damage. The defending player is going to roll a number of white die, defense dice equal to the damage value of the weapon. So with our recon unit, its damage is 2, as you guys can see here. So with our support unit, it's going to roll 2 defense dice. And if we look at its defense, which is a 6, each die that rolls a 6 is going to stop 1 point of damage. So let's go ahead and give them a roll and see if we get anything. So we did roll one success, so our support unit is only going to take one point of damage. So with support units, you are simply going to move its track down, or its gauge down on its card, so it has two hit points left. If a support unit ever takes all the damage on its hit point card, then you're simply going to remove it from the battlefield and place it back on the standby area, and you can bring it back out at a later point in the game by using a deploy card. Let me take you through this sequence one more time with one more example. So at this point, then again, we'll look at the player that has the highest card, which is going to be our Diamondback player over there with his secondary weapon, Viper Missile, which is 787. So from there, then we're going to go through that sequence again. First off, we'll check and make sure he has line of sight to his target, which normally he wouldn't, as if it was using a direct weapon, he would be blocked by this building which would provide full cover to this unit. But since our, it is a missile weapon and our support unit does have line of sight to him, we can go ahead and use it. So at this point, we're gonna go ahead and roll our attack dice and determine if we score a hit. From there, then we'll check our target number. So with the heavy hitter, it's going to need a five or better to score a hit. And there are no modifiers to this as it is an indirect weapon. It does not provide any cover from buildings or anything like that. So we successfully scored the hit and that weapon, as you guys can see here, does three damage. From there, then our hammer strike player is going to roll their defense. So with heavy hitters, their defense is normally a five or better. So he's going to grab three defensive dice and give them a roll. He rolled one five or better, so he's going to take two points of damage. Now with heavy hitters, they're going to work a little bit differently. When they take damage, again, they're going to either take one card from their hands, or they can take the top card of their draw deck and move it into their damage pile for each point of damage they take. So our player is going to go ahead and spend one card from their hands, and they'll move one card from their draw pile. Now with the damage pile, you can always look through there as a player. You can never rearrange any of those cards. So our player over here can look through this, but he cannot change the order of those cards in any way. Now, as the game goes on, if a player cannot take any cards from, say he's out of cards from his hands and his draw pile, then he will go ahead and reshuffle his discard pile and add it back to his draw pile to take damage. If a player's hand draw pile and discard pile are all out of cards any remaining cards that he has in his firing line will be it will be used as damage cards and they will not be resolved if a player is completely out of cards and has all 25 cards in his damage pile that player's heavy hitter has been destroyed the one other important thing to note that I want to point out real quick when resolving combat hits is that you can play reaction cards and each reaction card will tell you when you can play it for example, with our player that just took damage, he could choose to have played this missile defense card, as you guys can see here. And this card specifically says, play when hit by a missile attack. With this card, it's going to give your heavy hitter plus two to its armor save. So he would have had a three plus armor save instead of a five plus, which means that any die that rolls a three or better will save one point of damage from him taking that hit. The fourth phase in the round is the tagging phase. 
During this phase, you're going to start with the Glory Hound player tagging all the possible buildings that he is able to, and then moving around the board in a clockwise manner with each player following suit. In order to tag a building, you must have a GKR adjacent to it, and this is any unit with both the heavy hitters and all of the support units. They have to be adjacent to a building, and in order to tag it, they're going to place one of their tag tokens in that building in the spot that they're adjacent to. So, for example, with our heavy hitter here, he can tag this building, and he can only tag this spot that he's next to in that building. He could not choose to tag any of the other sections of that building, only the one that he's adjacent to. And then we have our other support unit here, which will tag this building here. Now, if you're adjacent to a building that has another player's tag, so let's go ahead and say, for example, that our player over here had a previously tagged this building here, our player now can choose to replace that tag with one of their own, removing it and adding their own token. From here, for each different building that our player tags, he gets to draw one sponsor card and add it to his hands. Now you can only have a maximum of five sponsor cards at a time. And if you have to draw more, then you'll have to discard down at the end. So our Glorion player has tagged both of his buildings. We're ready to move on to the next player, which is the Hammer Strike player, to tag his. So again, he has his heavy hitter is adjacent to this building, so we'll tag that one. And then his recon unit is adjacent to two different buildings, so he gets to choose which building he wants to tag. And for the building back here, he can tag this spot here. And for this building, he would tag this spot. So he's going to go ahead and choose to tag the big building in the back. And then he'll also get to draw two sponsor cards into his hand. Demolishing buildings is a very important step in the tagging phase. So a player is going to immediately win the game if they control four demolished buildings. And as soon as a player places their fourth tag on a building, they're going to demolish it. You're going to remove all of your tags from the building and return them to your faction's supply. You're also going to return all of the other player's faction tags to their area. And in order to demolish a building, you're going to remove all of the tags on that building and return them to the player's supplies. The player that demolished it will remove the building from the board, and not the base, and then place one of their tags in that building's demolished ruins. Demolishing a building is also going to move a player's pilot token one space to the right, as that is one of the achievements in order to move their pilot. Now, the one other important note is that once demolished, buildings no longer provide cover. However, all movement rules are still going to apply around buildings, so you still cannot move onto or through building spaces, except for the recon unit, which has those special rules. The final phase in a round is the reset phase, and during this phase, the players are going to recharge all of their energy back up to their 5 plus energy mark at the top of their board. From there, then each player is also going to replenish all their, their cards in their hands, and these are only going to apply to faction cards. So if a player has sponsor cards, they are not affected by this. So our Diamondback player here has four cards, so he'll draw back up to his starting hand of six. And if, in rare situations, a player has more than six cards in their hands, at this point, then they're going to have to discard down to six cards. And if their draw pile is empty, they can also reshuffle their discard pile to create a new draw pile. The final step is determining the Glory Hound player. So whoever placed the most tags in the previous phase becomes the new Glory Hound for the next round. If there is a tie for the most tags, the tied player closest to the Glory Hound in clockwise order becomes the new Glory Hound. And if the, the current Glory Hound is one of those tied players, they do not get to keep it. You're going to place the Glory Hound token in front of the new Glory Hound player. So both of our players tagged two buildings in the previous round. So our player over here was tied with the other player, and he cannot retain it. So it'll move to the next player that had that tie. Now, when the player gains the Glory Hound token, that is also one of the achievements. So he will get to move his pilot one space up on the track. The one other important note is if the Glory Hound player is the player that had the most tags in the previous round, then they will get to retain the Glory Hound token. At this point, then you would move on to the next round, continuing until one of the players is either has demolished four buildings or has eliminated all other players' heavy hitters. Well, I hope you guys found that video helpful. As always, if you have any questions or comments, please leave those in the comment section below and I'll do my best to answer them. And also, you can swing by my Facebook and Twitter accounts. Let me know what you guys are doing or playing. Always looking to start a conversation. I'd love to hear with, from you guys what you want me to cover as well. I'm only one person, and I'm only aware of so much out there. So if you see something new or really want something covered, let me know in those comments below or on one of my other accounts. 
As always, thank you guys so much for taking the time to watch my videos and leave me feedback on them. I do really appreciate it and I try to take into account everything you guys say to make the best possible videos. And if you guys want to help me out, if you enjoyed this video or found it helpful, please consider hitting that like button and subscribing to my channel as it really does help me to continue to grow and companies really look at those numbers. So it is very important to continue to up those numbers so that I can continue to covering these games and getting some of those really hot titles that are out there. So until next time, I'll see you guys later.